Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is John Quincy Adams, Part 5. We stopped last time in 1826, and John Quincy Adams was president. He was the sixth president. He got uh, word, and he'd been, off, he'd been in office about it a little more than a year, and he got word in late June that his father was, was, father's, uh, was, was dying. And so he, made, he traveled north to, to, to Boston, to Massachusetts, and, uh, but, he, but he didn't make it. His father was gone. His father, has died. his father had died, the famous John Adams, the second U.S. president. He lost his dad. And uh, after his father's death, uh, he, he wrote about coming home to Quincy and their home. Quote, Everything about the house is the same. I was not fully sensible of the change till I entered his bedchamber. That moment was inexpressibly painful and struck me as if it had been a, an arrow to the heart. My father and mother have departed. The charm which has always made this house to me an abode of enchantment is dissolved, and yet my attachment to it and to the whole region round is stronger than I ever felt it before. Uh, John Quincy Adams gave his uh, annual message to Congress in 1826, and uh, historian Richard Hofstetter, Hofstadter wrote this about that, uh, about that uh, speech. Quote, His first annual message to Congress was one of the most wholly impolitic documents in the history of government. Yet it was very prophetic because uh, eventually the, the things that he, he talked about all came to pass, including a, canals connecting the Chesapeake Bay to the Ohio River and Delaware Rivers, national roads, and military academies. John Quincy Adams had this to say, quote, in that message, among the first, perhaps the, the very first instrument for the improvement of the conditions of men is knowledge. He, he promoted uh, astronomical observatories, which he called lighthouses of the sky, and he was mocked for this. He really was a pioneer in astronomy, but, you know, way ahead of his time. He, was, he continued to be very worried about his son, George, and he wrote to him in 1827, recommending that he write a diary. And actually, for most of his life, John Quincy Adams would spend about an hour a day writing his diary. And he wrote this, quote, A diary is the timepiece of life and will never fail of keeping time or of getting out of order with it. A diary, if honestly kept, is one of the best preservatives of morals. A man who commits to paper from day to day the employment of his time, the places he frequents, the persons with whom he converses, the actions with which he is occupied, will have a perpetual guard over himself. His record is a second conscience of steady exertion and of composure in disappointment. And he wrote another letter in 1827 to his son Charles, who was experiencing depression. And he wrote this quote, The more you have of necessary occupation, the less you will feel of this depressing despondency. He believed that uh, waking up early in the morning formed moral character. And in a letter to Charles, he had this to say, quote, In 1828, Early rising is so indissolubly connected with many of the most active virtues that it may be laid down as an axiom of almost universal application. Give me an early riser, and I will give you a virtuous man. In another letter, he wrote this, quote, Genius is the child of toil. All my success in the world has been the blessing of heaven upon drudgery, the reward of untiring, unmitigated lab labors. During this time, finally, his, the third son was doing, was doing well. However, George and John were not doing well. They were, they were, they were, they were very troubled. He wrote this in 1827, quote, Without self-control, nothing difficult can be achieved, and the first victory to be won is over sensual indulgence. In February 1828, uh, his son John married a young lady named Mary Helen in the White House. George was really going down quickly. He was lazy, crazy, drinking, and womanizing. So his, his life was, was, really, was really in bad shape. The summer of 1827, John Quincy was sick, and he spent the summer in Quincy. At that time, the presidency was a nine-month year job, so you could spend three months of the summer. And most people wanted to get out of Washington City in the summer because of the, the threat of disease. Uh, he was supporting his brother Thomas, who was drinking and depressed. In 1828, there was the groundbreaking ceremony for the uh, Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, 
and John Quincy came and spoke, uh, spoke at that time. And he called that canal that was going to be dug, that he said this, quote, a conquest over physical nature, such as never yet been achieved by man. The wonders of the ancient world, the pyramids, the pyramids of Egypt, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Temple of Ephesus, the Mausoleum of Artemisia, the Wall of China, sink into significance before it. So that, you know, he loved this. You know, he's a funny guy and very intellectual, and he would love, love to make re these references in his speeches. So he was the guy who, who, who plunged the first shovel into the soil, and it hit a, the roots of a hickory tree, you know, right off the bat. And there was an ominous sign because they called Andrew Jackson Old Hickory. 1828 was a, uh, was a presidential election year, and he was up for re-election. And uh, the, uh, it was kind of, the Jackson campaign accused John Quincy Adams as acting as a pimp for the Russian Tsar when he had been there you know, as ambassador. Now, there were some allegations. There was some, there was some story that a, a young American lady had an affair with the Tsar, but uh, John Quincy had not, it was, was not, wasn't a pimp for the Tsar. And he responded to this uh, accusation, quote, he called it, quote, the thousand malicious lies which outvenom all the worms of the Nile River. <laughs> so this was uh, the 1828 election. Yeah, Jackson campaigned very, very hard, and, uh, and John Quincy basically not at all. He didn't believe in campaigning. And, uh, of course, he was very po unpopular from the beginning, and Jackson easily won the election, uh, one, he won, Jackson had 178 electoral votes and John Quincy 83. So that meant uh, John Quincy was a one-term president. During this time, the last year of his time in office, he, he became very uh, enthusiastic about tree planting. And he planted many trees on his Quincy property in Massachusetts, including oak, mape, maple, chestnut, walnut, shagbark, cherry, peach, plum, and apple. So by March of 1829, uh, Andrew Jackson was inaugurated as the uh, seventh U.S. president, and that was the end of uh, John Quincy's presidency. And he was actually planning to go to spend the rest of his life in in, in Massachusetts and retire there. And uh, but he he spent he he stayed on several months um, in Washington City after you know after giving up power and leaving the White House. And they got news in in, in June. Three months after after uh, he, he left the White House, that his his son George had died. He was 28 years old, and he had drowned uh, near New York City. He was on a Providence, Rhode Island to Washington City steamship. And John Quincy wrote this afterward: "Quote: There is a pressure upon my heart and upon my spirits, inexpressible, and which I never knew before." As it subsides, it gives way to dejection and despondency. So the reports were, uh, he was supposed to come to Washington, and, and you know, John Quincy was hoping that he could help him turn his life around. Uh, but uh, he was, he'd been doing all this drinking, and on the ship, reportedly, he was hallucinating. And he thought the uh, seabirds, you know, the, like the seagulls that would follow ships looking for food, he thought the seabirds were talking to him. And also the machinery of the ship, he thought the, sh the machinery was talking to him as well. He thought the passengers were talking about him and laughing at him, and he either fell or jumped off the ship. So that was that was very tragic. And uh, but uh, this this brought uh, John Quincy and Louisa closer to each other. However, John Quincy was depressed. He came home to Quincy and spent some time there and uh, was trying to figure out what to do. He, he spent time writing a biography of his father, John Adams, but he he it wasn't. Uh, you know, he couldn't uh, really focus on that. And then some, some people came to him and asked him if he would be interested in being uh, serving again in the House of Representatives. And he jumped on that idea. He thought, well, oh, I, I, he wanted to do it. So he accepted that. And he was elected and to the House of Representatives representing his district in Massachusetts. And he served for the rest of his life for the next 18 years, from 1830 to 1848. One of his great, great achievements during that time was to... Uh, John Smithson was a wealthy Englishman who donated money for uh, what became the Smithsonian Institute to increase 
and he called it, it was meant for, quote, the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And John Quincy, one of his great achievements was uh, really fighting to save that money for its intended purpose. After being elected by his constituents, the people in his district, uh, for U.S. Congress, he wrote this, quote, My election as President of the United States was not so, not half so gratifying. So he had, this is actually the, some, actually the best parts of his, times of his life, maybe not the happiest, but the most productive. He continued to be an intellectual, and uh, he, he enjoyed the history, and he jo- enjoyed poetry, enjoyed love. He loved writing poetry. In 1831, he wrote a 90 stanza uh, with, with each, lines, each line, uh, eight lines in each stanza, a poem about a guy named Dermot Mac- McMurrow, who was the king of Leinster in Ireland, who, to retain his throne in a struggle with other Irish kings in the 12th century, entered into an alliance with King Henry of England, which led to the eventual subjugation of Ireland by England. So this guy, you know, basically was a traitor. And uh, he wrote this poem about a very tragic fellow who, because of his actions, he helped the Ira- uh, England conquer Ireland. He wrote, so he wrote this very long poem. Uh, in, in 1831, John Quincy considered Cicero the greatest mind of ancient Rome, and one of his regrets in life, he wished that as a young man, he had been able to spend one year entirely studying Cicero in Latin. And he believed that if he had done that, he could be more useful to his country. Uh, you got to love John Quincy Adams. In 1834, his son John was also dying of alcoholism. Tragic. He wrote this quote, John Quincy wrote this quote, Public affairs, inauspicious as their movements are, afford me rather relief and relaxation from these heavier domestic and personal afflictions. I think this is why he wanted to serve in Congress, because uh, he had these things that were really weighing him down, the death of his son George and now his, his son John. And um, so this, he seemed to need, to, need to, to keep working. He couldn't really retire. In 1834, his son, Char- the one son Charles, who was who was doing well, took charge of the family finances, so he didn't have to worry about that. And John Quincy wrote this about about his son: "Quote, all my hopes of futurity in this world are now centered upon him and upon his employment of his time." Uh, Paul C. Nagel, the historian, wrote this: "Quote, immediately it was as if a great hand was lit, a great." Lude was lifted from his shoulders, as indeed it was. So, yeah, his son Charles really was a big help So that, because the, the financial issues were pretty complicated with the different people that he was supporting in their various properties. In 1834, Louisa wrote a letter to their son Charles, and she said this, quote, Your father is a sturdy white oak and not to be crushed by the reptiles who envy his talents and would destroy him if they could. Uh, she wanted him to retire, and she, as she said, quote, From all these ill-requited troubles, how much of bitter strife, of endless toil, of mortified vanity, and of disappointed ambition would be saved to himself and his family. However, he could not retire, as she wrote, quote, Without risking a total extinction of life for the want of a suitable sphere of action. So she was kind of, she was fed up with his political career, but she knew that she ne- he needed to do it. In September of, of 1834, their son John died of alcoholism. He was 31. And uh, John Quincy wrote this, quote, Let me believe that for suffering upon earth there is some compensation in heaven, and that there the tears of sorrow are wiped away, and that every virtue shall be blessed with its reward. My child, my child. So he was, this was devastating, the death of two sons. During his, he called his morning walks, quote, a melancholy pilgrimage in which to divert my thoughts from the bitterness of my misfortune. The Marquis de Lafayette was visiting the U.S. in 1834, and uh, there was a tribute to him, the great French volunteer of the American Revolution. And, and in, in this tribute, John Quincy said this, quote, How strange was that deep conviction of the French people that their chief glory and happiness consisted in the vehemence of their affection for their king because he was descended in an unbroken male line of genealogy from St. Louis. So all these, King Louis XVII, all these uh, kings, uh, and uh, apparently, I didn't know this, he was 
they were descended from a from a saint or a man considered a saint. I mean, not, not good thing to study. In 1834, uh, Paul C. Nagel wrote this about about that time. John Quincy Adams took special delight in a report about a beggar who slipped into the White House one night and found his ways his way upstairs to President Jackson's bedroom. There, at 2 a.m., the intruder began pounding on the locked door, shouting that he was hungry. Such was the White House security in 1835. That same year, this Englishman, John Smithson, gave the United States $500,000, or it was bequeathed, for the purpose of establishing the, quote, Smithsonian Institution for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. And, you know, the thing is, all these congressmen thought, ah, look at this money. Let's, let's, let's spend it. And uh, John Quincy had to fight. He fought hard. He said no. And he didn't even want it to be, like, used for public schools or universities. He, he wanted, he said, we have to use this for one thing and one thing only. Uh, historian William J. Cooper wrote this, quote, Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries and into the 21st, the, the Smithsonian Institution developed into a depository for national treasures and a variety of educational and research activities. No one was more responsible than Adams for guaranteeing that the, the Smithsonian Endowment did not become a piggy bank for self-interested politicians. Moreover, no one else had more impact on placing the institution on the path that led to its current distinction. So that was one of the great achievements of his life. Achievements of his life, the uh, Smithsonian Institution. In 1835, John Quincy attended a Harvard program of student orations in Cambridge, Ma Cambridge Massachusetts. Paul C. Nagel wrote this quote. He expressed horror at the deterioration he thought he saw in student performance. John Quincy wrote this about, about this uh, performance. How flat, how stale, and unprofitable now. So he believed that uh, Harvard was seriously declining and that he, he, felt, he thought maybe this is his cause, that Harvard needed, quote, an electric shock to restore it from a paralytic state, and I will make an effort to apply it. However, there was no interest in his offer to help uh, revive Harvard, so that did not become his cause. His cause became slavery, which was a more and more uh, an explosive issue. In 1835, uh, John Quincy wrote this, quote, Slavery is, in all probability, the wedge which will ultimately split up this union. It is the source of all the disaffection to it in both parts of the country. So he was, uh, yeah, this led to him, you know, actually getting a lot of critics. And uh, uh, John Quincy wrote to his son Charles in 1836, quote, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was tortured by an imagination that the whole human race without a single exception, were leagued together in a conspiracy for his destruction. I have not yet come to that. And he was talking about his political enemies, and he mentioned them, quote, Jackson, Van Buren, Webster, White, and Harrison, by themselves or by their ambassadors, are parties to this holy alliance. They hunt me like a partridge upon the mountains. They had what they called was, there was this House gag rule thing. In the, in the House of Representatives, Congress... Uh, uh, representatives would receive what they call pet petitions. I think it's true today. Uh, any citizen can write a letter and basically expressing an opinion or asking for something, and then that, that letter, that petition, can be read in the House. And uh, there were more and more petitions coming in to uh, congressmen from the North uh, protesting against slavery. You know, people, the abolition movement was growing stronger and stronger. And then this uh, so-called gag rule had been passed in which it was prohibited to mention slavery in the House. And, uh, and so the, and this became actually uh, John Quincy's greatest cause because he fought the gag rule. And uh, he, he was, cons they had all these, uh, up, there was an uproar in Congress because he was, uh, he, would, he would talk about slavery and then the, the, there would be an objection. So uh, because of his, his words, these, when he would violate the gag rule, there was a move to have him censured and now if, that, if, if that happens, then the individual has the right to defend themselves. In 1837, on February 9th, he had a full day, gave a full-day speech in his defense, quote, and he said this, quote, Let that gentleman, let every member of this house ask his own heart with what confidence, with what boldness, with what freedom, with what firmness he would give utterance to his opinions on this floor 
if for every word for a mere question asked of the speaker involving a question belonging to human freedom, to the rights of man, he was liable to be tried as a felon or an incendiary and sent to the penitentiary. He's trying to say, yeah, this uh, house gag rule is, you know, it's, 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 it's immoral, it's, it's illegal because, you know, freedom is one of the great uh, concepts of America. And you can't talk about freedom in the house. So this, uh, and anyway, in 1836, he said this, quote, I hold the resolution, that means the gag rule, to be a direct violation of the Constitution of the United States, the rules of the House, and the rights of my constituents. So he fought the gag rule for eight years, and this was part. This was really when he became, you know, this great uh, leader fighting against slavery. Because the first right was to be able to talk about to talk about slavery, and these Southern congressmen didn't want it to even be to be brought up because they were so uh, defensive about it. Harlow Giles Unger wrote this, quote, Louisa fretted about his health and safety, but she found, but she had lost all influence over him and could, could do nothing to restrain him. He was unstoppable, a meteor spiraling out of control in the political firmament. See, I, she's, he's talking about he, he kept in, you know, objecting to the gag rule and getting up and, and talking and saying things about, mentioned slavery and there would be, uproar in the house and and it was uh, and, and, and th- this really became his great cause in life. In February 1837, their home on F Street, the mailbox was flooded with more than the usual number of death threats. It's getting all these death threats. And Louisa wrote this quote, Dark terror round my spirit cling, protect us against the murderer's hand. Oh hear our cry and pity Lord, for blood for blood they lust. So he was a very brave man. He, he, he wasn't gonna, he didn't back down. He never backed down. And he did not enjoy quiet days in the House uh, of Representatives. Paul C. Nagel wrote this quote. What Adams preferred to, to describe were, were days, were the days when pandemonium ruled as members, mostly from the South, tried to subdue whom some of them called, quote, the madman from Massachusetts. So this was his great cause, and he loved, this is where where he showed his warrior spirit. Uh, John Quincy and Louisa were raising uh, their two granddaughters uh, of their son, John, who had died, and Paul C. Nagel wrote this quote, No youngsters had a more thoughtful grandpa than John. Under his supervision, granddaughters Mary Louisa and Fanny, now aged 10 and 8, read the Bible in French and English. So the, the Andrew Jackson, who was president, uh, you know, he was, they, were, they continued to be enemies and politi- political enemies. And he called, uh, he referred to John Quincy Adams, quote, wickedness has never been surpassed by anything in recorded history. <laughs> so kind of exaggerating there. In 1838, uh, James Madison died, one of the founding fathers. And uh, John Quincy gave a speech in which he talked about the fact that the American revolutionary generation was disappearing through death. And he said this, quote, Where are they now? We look around in vain. To them, this crowded theater, full of human life in all its stages of existence, full of the glowing exultation of youth, of the steady maturity of manhood, the sparkling eyes of beauty, and the gray hairs of revered age. All this to them is as the solitude of the sepulcher. We think of this and say, how short is human life? But then we turn back our thoughts again to the scene, over which the falling curtain has but now closed upon the drama of the day. From the saddening thought that they are no more, we call for comfort upon the memory of what they were, and our hearts leap for joy that they were our fathers. Oh, very touching, you know, because he'd lost his father, and uh, his father, he had, he had a good father, and his father was gone, so... That's why it was very personal for him, the disappearance of the founding father's generation. In 1839, John Quincy had time-consuming correspondence with an actor named James H. Hackett, who often portrayed the the Shakespeare character Hamlet. And uh, John Quincy called, called Shakespeare's Hamlet, quote, the masterpiece of the human mind, the heart and soul of man, and all their perfection and their frailty. His correspondence with this actor, this fellow, uh, Hackett, was published, and then uh, 
he, he called their correspondence, quote, more tickling to my vanity than it was to be elected president of the United States. In August, there was a slave ship uh, called the Amistad, which was uh, transporting slaves in Cuba from one place to another. In Cuba, the roads were so bad, it was faster to go by boat. And uh, Now, the slave trade at this time had been, was illegal. Uh, the British and Americans had, had, you know, slavery was still being practiced, but the slave trade was illegal. And this was a, this was a ship that had brought new slaves from Africa and, uh, and you know, and was able to get them across the Atlantic. Uh, and so it was, it was illegal under inter international law. And they were being transferred from one place to another in Cuba. And there was a rebellion on the ship, and the slaves took over the ship. And, they, and then the remaining crewmen who, were, who survived the rebellion, they were, the slaves ordered them to, take, to sail the ship back to Africa. And then uh, during the day, you know, when the sun is out, it's easy to tell you know, direction, you know, the sun, east and west. So they were, th during the day, they were sa sailing east to Africa. But during the night, uh, these, uh, the, the, the sailors were actually going, going west. And, this, and they ended up in Connecticut. And the, the, the ship was uh, actually captured. And the slaves all uh, ended up in jail in New Haven, Connecticut, 53 slaves. Now the, and then, then, then there was this big legal issue that, that, that erupted. Should they be free or should they be slaves? Now, the Spanish found out about it. And they said, this is our property. It needs to be returned to uh, Cuba. And uh, then there was, because of the abolition movement, the abolitionists have said, no. This is, you know, they wanted them to be freed. And um, so it became a, a big, a, a big uh, legal, a legal issue that eventually uh, John Quincy became very heavily involved in. During this time, uh, politics was keeping him alive. And uh, in 1838, he wrote about, uh, there was a story, of Bo uh, some Boston banks had gone bankrupt and could not pay their depositors. John Quincy wrote this quote, Oh, you Boston banks, how, how I blush to think what exposures are made from day to day, and the worst and basest of all in my own native land. Alas, there is something worse than that. It is the coldness and indifference with which these disclosures are received. It is to see these insolent banks demanding to be absolved from the penalties of their own delinquencies. In 1838, John Quincy wrote about the lessons of Christianity, which he called, quote, lessons of peace, of benevolence, of meekness, of brotherly love, of charity, utterly incompatible with the ferocious spirit of slavery. The temperance movement was gaining steam. Those who wanted to ban uh, alcohol, make it illegal, and John Quincy did not support that. He believed that true reform came to the alcoholic only, quote, by the dictate of his own conscience and the energy of his own will. Of course, there was no Alcoholics Anonymous back then to help people or rehabs. In 1840, John Quincy tripped on the floor of the house and dislocated his right shoulder. Although it was uh, somebody was able to get it, push it back in, and he was able to, con he was okay. Paul C. Nagel wrote this quote, By now, for Adams, nearly 73, the challenge of standing guard over the virtue in the house was more sustaining than, than, than even his food and drink. So he was really getting it. He was really enjoying his time in, in Congress. Louisa was struggling with depression. She wrote a story, which she called Adventures of a Nobody, and she was eating a lot of chocolate, sketching, and uh, cultivating silkworms. We're going to have to stop now. We'll continue next time. Thank you very, very much for watching. Hope you find a good history book to read. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.